Okay, good morning and welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Space Coast. I'm Reverend Jenna Watkins and I'm glad to welcome you here today. Um, and this is a good time to remind you to silence your cell phones if you haven't already done so. If you've never been to a Center for Spiritual Living before, we believe that there is one God and many paths to that God. And we are here to love, honor, and support you no matter what your divine path is. The Center for Spiritual Living Space Coast is a safe haven for people of all beliefs and lifestyles. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on your journey of faith, you are welcome here. So uh, today I will be your MC and your practitioner, and uh, Ed will be our reader today. We have a wonderful guest speaker, Steve Kindisfather. So he'll be speaking today. But just to remind you that we have a book group that meets every Tuesday at 2 p.m. on Zoom. Uh, the book is Fear is called Fear is a Choice. You're welcome to join whether you have the book or not. It's a wonderful group. They have really deep discussions, so please join them. And also, if you're interested in the uh, conscious aging class that Ron, Reverend Ron and Becky are going to be teaching, there's a sign-up sheet on the back. And for those of you online, if you're interested, uh, give a shout out to Reverend Dr. Ron Fox. And next week is our unexpected income Sunday. So take some time this week to set an attention to read some receive something good coming your way that's unexpected and grateful to receive. Um, so now we have more music. So this is the moment to, for some nice contemplation, meditation, prayer. So if you'd like to just turn within, Relax and let us recognize that there is a heaven within. The heaven within is that place where we connect with the High Holy One, with the steep, deep spiritual force of our nature. That Mother, Father, God, that spiritual essence that moves into itself to create each and every one of us. We are an idea in the mind of God. And we are that place that heaven resides as we touch and tap into the spiritual truth of who we are. And I give thanks that we are aware of our essence, aware of our true nature. And I know that as we go forth this day, we go forth with that awareness, leading us, guiding us, helping us to grow and learn and heal, to share words that soften others' hearts, to understand how to achieve the good that we all desire, to bring that peace on earth to this planet now through our love, through our connection, through our desire. And I give thanks today for our guest speaker, Steve Kint's father, for being willing to share his wisdom, his ideas, his thoughts with each and every one of us. Ideas that help us learn more about ourselves and each other, to grow deeper in our awareness of our true spirit, our true nature and to live in harmony, and so it is. And now it's time for Reverend Ed. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> uh, I titled this, Our Connection to Nature. Uh, the Center for Spiritual Living teaches that we are not separate from anything that nature, the entire universe, is one living, <laughs> loving <laughs> uh, system. Every part supporting every other part. 
and the whole. In this living, loving system, we have evolved and uh, to have uh, to be self-aware and to have intellect. And we've used that intellect to master the elements. In Western culture, since the Industrial Revolution, about 1760, the idea grew that there was little connection between the objects of the world and individuals. Before that time, most people believed that they could affect matter and the environment through their thoughts. With the Industrial Revolution, however, the elements of nature lost their living quality in people's eyes. They became objects to be categorized, named, torn apart, and examined. When people began to dissect the universe in those terms, they had already lost their love for it. It became soulless for them, and uh, only then could they examine it without qualm and without being aware of the living voice that protested. Most people's thoughts no longer seemed to have an effect on nature because their mind saw themselves apart from it. They became blind to the connection their thoughts and their, had on their physical environment and experience. And the reason for that was because the Centers for Spiritual Living and Loving, uh, there, there's a teaching that goes, as long as you hold that conscious belief, you will experience it as reality. And now, Reverend Stephen Kinsfather will talk to us about being in harmony with nature. Ed, thank you for that wonderful teaching reading. I'm just in a place of gratitude this morning. So just good morning, beautiful ones. I am Reverend Steve Kin's father, and I'm coming to you from Golden, Colorado. I'm grateful for you listening to this message. I'm grateful for Reverend Dr. Ron Fox for the invitation to speak here at Space Coast. And I'm grateful for Becky and her selection of music. They perfectly blend with what I have to say today. Compliment. And I'm, again, just in that place of, of gratitude and ask you to join me there. I have titled my talk today, In Harmony with Nature. In March, we recognize and honor Women's History Month. So I'd like to share a little about two of my all-time favorite women, their mother nature, and Grandmother Earth. Like the indigenous Native American tribes, I use Grandmother Earth out of respect for my elders and for acknowledgement of our oneness with the earth. Grandmother Earth is our home, an entire planet, not only for we humans, but a life source, a life support for all creatures, great and small. Mother Nature to me is the essence of the creator and its expression through natural laws. I'm comfortable using the word God for the creator of all of that is. God is a simple name for that which truly cannot be named. So whatever God means to you, whatever name you choose to use for this higher power or creator is all okay. More important than a name is our relationship with God. We all have our own unique understanding of God. Prior to childhood, and I believe prior to birth, we develop our relationship with God into what we perceive it is today. I believe we're each our own expression of God as God. Our personal relationship with her is something we should explore and cultivate. My parents practiced religious science in the 1950s before I was born, and I think that's one of the reasons I chose them. As my older sister, younger brother, and I each became old enough to put words into sentences, it's about the same time my parents taught each of us this prayer. It goes like this. God is good. God is love. 
God is harmony, and God is in me. I'd appreciate it if you'd just please take a minute and repeat that prayer with me as I say the first line and you repeat it after me. Very simple. Let's become children. This is what I said at bedtime as, as a young child. God is good. God is good. God is love. God is love. God is harmony. God is harmony. And God is in me. And God is in me. And so it is. And so it is. So for my whole life, that prayer describes what God is and what God means to me. I was never led to believe that God was a bearded man in the sky judging people, punishing most and rewarding some. And if you're listening to me speak from a CSL, you're likely aware that Ernest Holmes is the founder of religious science, that teaching which I speak about and some of us understand more deeply than others, but it's what we're talking about today. And Ernest Holmes developed the science of mind teaching, and he wrote the science of mind textbook. <laughs> of his volumes of thoughts and writings about God and spiritual practice, this one sums it up for me, or at least it states, states it more simply. We believe in the unity of all life, and that the highest God and the innermost God are one God. We believe that God is personal to all that fill this indwelling presence. Our indigenous elders, they share in this knowing of God, and they know it as the great spirit, creator of a perfect home for us. They show respect and gratitude when they refer to her as Grandmother Earth. When God created the earth, she wisely put Mother Nature in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. Mother Nature is God in form, and this Divine Mother lovingly holds us in her arms. We're all God's children, and she loves us each unconditionally. Mother Nature offers us her lessons, and when she does so, it's important that we listen. And yet some of us are hard of hearing. Some do not listen to Mother Nature, and they do not understand her laws. You can call it science of mind, religious science. It's referred to as new thought, ancient wisdom, but it's a teaching and it's a spiritual practice. And it's just one path toward increasing our understanding of oneness and that there are spiritual laws and principles in place always working for us, whether we recognize them or not. I'm convinced that the more we listen to God, the more aware we become of spiritual principles and those natural laws. And then we begin to understand them. They're all around us. An excellent way to commune with God and to fill our oneness is to go out into nature, observe, listen, and be surrounded by nature herself. Henry David Thoreau says this, my profession is to always find God in nature. Some years ago, my wife, um, Terry, took a photograph of me as I was taking a knee alongside one of the headstones in the Fort Logan National Cemetery in Denver, Colorado. It's one of about 150,000 perfectly aligned headstones that all appear the same until you read the individual inscriptions on them. I posed for a photograph with this one so that I have a reminder of its unique engraving in harmony with nature. You have a memory of being in nature and feeling the presence of God. Perhaps you recall lying on the grass, looking up at the sky and the clouds and sense the presence of God. Just looking up at the sky, far from the city lights on a clear night, the vastness of all those stars. Even now, just thinking about it makes me feel small and insignificant. It evokes a feeling of oneness, and we may even question our place in it all. Yeah, I know that go out and to view the stars would require you to actually leave your house, be out after dark, but just being out in nature alone can be kind of scary. I get that, especially after dark, but it's worth it if you're feeling the presence of God. There's another woman I'd like to mention. It's Women's History Month. 
because I admire her for her optimistic outlook while facing tremendous fear. And her name is Anne Frank, best known for her diary. Anne Frank was a Jewish victim of the Holocaust. And out of her 16 years of life, Anne Frank spent 761 days of it in hiding. I see her as so insightful and spiritual by what she wrote in her diary. And I'll quote this. The best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely, or unhappy is to go outside, somewhere where they can be quiet, alone with the heavens, nature, and God. Because only then does one feel that all as it should be, and that God wishes to see people happy amidst the simple beauty of nature. I believe Anne Frank was and is in harmony with nature. And it's from this place we sense our oneness with God and all living things. These are science mind principles and truths of who we are. I had a personal experience of feeling God and sensing oneness when I was alone in nature. Calling it, and I'd like to share it now as best I can. As I describe, as I describe or walk you through this experience, I invite you to close your eyes and join me on this nature, nature walk. I'm going to have a drink here. Join me on this nature walk. So if you're coming along, put on your hiking boots and your rain jacket and watch your step in the forest. Everything is damp and from the soaking rain that just passed through. Breathe in the cool, crisp air. It's humid. The air is freshly cleansed from the rain. All of the trees towering around us smell of pine and wet wood. Breathing in that fresh scent, we also notice the rich, earthy smell of the damp ground below. Everything is alive and it's growing. And the overcast sky is barely visible through the trees, and it seems to be slowly moving. Barely detectable are clouds and the intermittent, lightly glowing flashes in the distance. Hear the faint sound of the distant thunder rumbling after each flash. Listen now to the sound of a nearby brook. Follow the sound, moving closer to it. And now we can see and hear the brook gurgling and giggling, newly invigorated by the rain. Rays of sunlight pierce the gray sky and begin slicing between the trees. Birds can be heard. Birds can be heard as they too are newly invigorated by that rain. We notice a single drop, single raindrop backlit by a ray of sunshine. It appears as a tiny prism reflecting the rainbow. That drop dangles from the end of a lacy fern leaf that curls out over the brook. In this precious moment, we become one with that raindrop. Now one with the raindrop, we let go and we joyfully freeze fall, splashing into the brook below. No longer are we a single drop, we are the water. Dangling and laughing, flowing as one. Everything is flowing together, perfectly as one. All water is welcome, joining in from many sources. Raindrops from the sky, crevices gently pour in water. Larger tributaries begin to dance with us, joyfully dancing water. We become a stream and then a river. We still sense we're a single raindrop, and yet we know we are part of a larger system. We know we're an integral part of all sources of water. And as water, we flow with everything, all of it. Everything is God, oneness. A single raindrop that fell from a leaf, then growing to a river, we flowingly dance. We delight in our emergence with the ocean, and now as a slow dance. God is like the ocean and we as drops. We are not the whole of God, Yet God is all of us and all there is. Grateful for our journey 
we slowly return to where we begun. We become present in the moment and present in the present. So gently and slowly open your eyes. And just when Becky chose that song, I've dreamed of rain and the rain came. It was touching to me for I knew that was in my talk and she didn't. So that synchronicity again, thank you. Thanks, Becky. And as I was sharing that experience with you now, I just, I relived it. I felt the deep realization of oneness, oneness with nature and as water. There's a book titled Be Water, My Friend. Some of you may know it's authored by Bruce Lee. He was not only a master of the martial arts, he was a master of self-discovery and power of the mind. And in his book, he said, empty your mind, be formless, shapeless like water. You put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. And I think what God is to me, Bruce Lee knew as chi. It's the same power. It's an inner knowing that gives us an inspiration and a confidence and we can tap into it. Because of his oneness with God or chi, when Bruce Lee found himself suddenly surrounded by bad guys, even though they had daggers and long sticks or whatever weapons, Bruce called on his inner chi, and then he grinned, knowing he had the upper hand. It is the same inner chi or God that allows us to be in harmony with nature, even if it's only in our mind. What if we all knew that we are as essential as water is to life. There's an author, he's a trainer, personal coach, speaker, many things. His name is Jonathan Lockwood Huey, and he said this, as many raindrops join to form a great river of water, many souls join their highest intent to form the river of evolved consciousness. It's in beautifully with what I'm saying. We experience evolved consciousness, our relationship with God becomes essential as water is to life in all of its forms. And water is also a good metaphor for God in its triune nature. That same water can be a liquid, can be a vapor or a solid, still the same water in many forms in that triune nature. In the science of mind teaching, the triune nature of God is explained as spirit, soul, and body. And some know the triune nature as Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The founder of Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes, explained the triune nature as the thing, how it works, and what it does. When various faith paths hold similar beliefs with slightly different names and slightly different paths, Ernest Holmes termed this the golden thread of truth. And that golden thread of truth that flows through all religions is much like water flowing through grandmother earth. Rivers, ponds, lakes, and streams, they all have different names, but they all contain water. Just as religions do, they all contain truths. That's a quote from Muhammad Ali. Anybody remember Muhammad Ali? How about when he was Cassius Clay? When Cassius Clay, the boxer, made his way to the top of the heavyweight division in 1964, he took the opportunity to declare freely, Cassius Clay is a slave name, and I didn't choose it, and I don't want it. I'm Muhammad Ali, a free name, and that means beloved of God. Though Muhammad Ali was known most as a fighter, he was also a spiritual man, and he was in harmony with nature. And he believed he was the greatest because of his inner knowing and his connection to the vine, the divine, same as Bruce Lee. People that connect with that, we're powerful. We just need to know it and observe it and bring it forward. It's already in there. So before I go on, I trust you're seeing that what I choose to call God has many names. And there's just as many pathways towards understanding what our relationship is with God or chi or spirit or the thing itself. I'm wanting you to see the many paths and then go explore them as well. My dad wanted his children to see and explore many paths and the experience of feeling um, God in nature. Um, it was one summer when my dad wanted to make sure that we found God in nature. What he had in mind was not exactly clear, 
Um, but he told my mom it was pretty much a week-long camping trip. And from the description, my mom and my sister both opted out. I was about 12 years old, and my brother was about 10, and dad took us to meet Grandmother Earth and spend time with Mother Nature. We were both out of school for the summer, and dad scheduled time off work so we could all spend eight days far away from the comforts of home. That's a little frightening, too, at that age. But my dad had already taught us a lot about camping and how to fish and hunt, and so we were excited, but a little apprehensive. My brother and I knew that this trip was something beyond all of those, and that the Boy Scout motto, be prepared, came to mind as we spent several days preparing, discussing, and deciding what to bring. Probably spent additional hours um, trying to find the things once we determined we need to bring them. Dad took care of most of the details and the essential stuff, we hoped, and he stressed that we needed to pack light, have good shoes, a rain jacket, and warm clothes to change into. My brother and I knew uh, to bring some fishing gear and some snacks and our toothbrushes, and we knew it was always good to have some uh, stick waterproof matches and a waterproof container. We were young boys and out of school for the summer, so uh, running around and barefoot and cutoffs and sometimes a shirt, packing warm clothes uh, didn't make that much sense to us then, but we thought about it and um, making a fire, we knew that would keep us warm, but then dad reminded us of how cold the mountains get at night and we did pack accordingly. So there was an unusual anticipation and some unusual, um, usual anticipation, I guess I'm trying to say, and some unusual that Friday night when it finally got here and we knew we were leaving the next morning. Um, that night, we boys loaded some of our stuff in the car, and we staged the rest of it in the house, ready to load and go early in the morning. Um, my mom and sister didn't seem very sad that the three boys were leaving. Mom seemed a little concerned that we would survive and make it back, but just not too soon, I guess. Saturday morning did arrive, and we headed out early. We left my mother and sister with the house free of boys, and I don't know how they managed. After a long drive, we went to stop for lunch, we arrived at the Sandlin Ranch above Steamboat Springs. Mr. Sandlin, you can picture him as the big rancher guy, he gestured where he wanted dad to park. And instantly, I got the feeling most people did, as Mr. Sandlin said. As told, dad parked next to the red truck, but not in front of the gate. Dad then instructed my brother and I to carry our gear over to where two ranch hands we're putting tack on the horses. After some dialogue with Mr. Sandlin, dad gave him a really nice deer rifle with the scope on it, and he threw in the case. Then he handed over some cash and the car keys, followed by a handshake. Now my brother and I really wondered what we were in for. We next learned that the ranch heads had already signed us, sized us up the minute we stepped out of the car. Seven horses made it, three for us to ride, two pack horses for our gear, and two personalized saddles belonging to our guides were on the other horses. With a little help in getting mounted up, we started off on a visible narrow dirt trail. One guide was leading us from the front and the uh, front of the pack and the other followed behind making sure we were doing okay. Both were far better riders than the three of us they showed a little concern about us making it, but they didn't make us feel too adequate about our riding skills. It's about 20 minutes into the ride, as I'm recalling, that there was no longer a trail, and we could no longer see man-made structures, including the town of Steamboat. We were blazing our way high into the mountains. After riding for about over an hour, we finally reached a spot where the river crossed our path, and there was still snow on the ground. Pretty much we were forced to stop there and we agreed this would be our camp. We all dismounted, some far more gracefully than others. We began unloading our gear from the pack horses as the other five enjoyed a drink from the river. With another handshake, we thanked the guides, they wished us well, and agreed to return about the same time the following Saturday. The three of us watched our last sight of another human as the guides and all seven horses disappeared back into the woods. Whew. 
We heard more than saw them drop back over that hill that we had just come up, the last part of our horseback ride to our new home. Home, except we, all we saw were trees and snow, and we were glad we packed those warm clothes. And we saw a rushing river. Hmm, this is our home. The three of us were alone in nature. For the next week, the only man-made things we saw, we had put there. The only man-made sounds we heard, we made them. We had nothing electric or battery operated. We didn't even have a watch. Cell phones didn't exist then. Think about what that means, unable to connect with anyone. What if we have an injury or an emergency? Well, it would just have to wait a week. Our running water was the river. Our stove required that we gathered wood and build a campfire. We did make a ring from stones and the fire in it was our heat and our replacement for TV. And we had no choices of channels. There was one afternoon about three days in as I recalled and we were reminded of civilization as a commercial airplane passed high above overhead. It was the only one we saw the entire week. We had a kind of heavy canvas tent my dad had planned to bring and plenty of room in it for the three of us and our gear, but it was difficult to keep it warm at night. We had just some food, mostly canned goods. We had some space food sticks and a couple of potatoes. So catching fish was no longer just for fun or sport. My dad brought a 22 revolver pistol. We all knew how to handle it and shoot it at that young age. We respected and knew about firearms. Maybe we could hit a rabbit if we saw one, but anything much larger would larger than that would be pretty tough to bring down. We weren't interested in seeing things larger than that. And yet having that pistol made me extra alert about our safety. Again, an injury of any kind would have to wait a week. I remember we young boys relied on dad a lot for what we should do. There are so many comforts of home that I gave up. Things in society that I just didn't have. Things that most of us take for granted. I also gained so many lessons in self-reflection, self-confidence, and I gained a total appreciation for grandmother earth and mother nature. And all of this came about to me embedded in my heart from a very early age by being in harmony with nature. I understand you may not be able to or even want to have that kind of total immersion in nature, but thankfully there are other options for bringing nature into our lives. I think we can and should experience nature through gardening, walking barefoot, walking in or next to water. In Colorado, that means a lake or a river. People in Florida, no matter where in Florida, you're pretty close to the ocean, if not right up against it. All our different trees that we experience, we can experience it from walking in those trees in a park or our own yard. And even without leaving the house, we can enjoy nature from plants. You could stay in your chair and possibly view trees through a window or view the ocean. I'm asking you to seek and create your own sources of nature. Learn to appreciate nature in all of its forms. That headstone in the Fort Logan Cemetery that bears the inscription in harmony with nature. Just below it is the soldier's name, Warner Bert Kinn's father. It's my dad. I can remember my dad getting upset when he observed people disrespecting Mother Nature. I guess I'm becoming more like him. You can say or do a lot of things, but don't disrespect my mother. It bothers me when I notice, maybe you've noticed them too, TV commercials. They're advertising trucks and SUVs. They, several manufacturers, not just one, they're all proudly showing their vehicles are capable of just tearing up the land, doing burnouts and to me, that's the face of Grandmother Earth. Then the next thing they show is the vehicles blasting through a river. When did this become okay? These people have never experienced oneness in a drop of water. Perhaps we could say to them, 
I am in harmony with Mother Nature. Grandmother Earth grows tired of the way we've been mistreating her. And still, Mother Nature keeps providing us and nurturing us. I think we could all show a greater respect for Mother Nature and Grandmother Earth. People today, including car manufacturers, could learn better practices from the Native American tribes. <clears throat> a mighty leader of peaceful, practice, peaceful practices among the Native American peoples was Black Elk. He was a Lakota Sioux medicine man and second cousin to Crazy Horse. If you'd like to learn more about his, his ways, his spiritual peace and being in harmony with nature, an excellent read is the book, Black Elk Speaks. And in this book, one thing he said is, as you walk, I'm sorry, but got to find the right quote here. As you walk upon the sacred earth, treat each step as a prayer. Say that again, giving respect and honoring what Black Elk said. As you walk upon the sacred earth, treat each step as a prayer. I was privileged to participate in a class called Native American Spirituality. Science of Mind Minister and our spiritual teacher of the Lakota Way, Reverend Dr. Patty Luchenbach, invited the class to come to her home in nature. The home where she and her husband Luke live is on sacred land that they call Pine Top. And one afternoon in the time of the falling leaf, Dr. Patty ended a Lakota ritual telling us to take our journals into the woods and listen to the trees. As I walked into the trees, many voices spoke to me. Some people in the class stopped at the first tree they saw or heard, but I kept going. I knew there would be a place where I could sit and write, and I was seeking an older, wise tree. I kept walking into the trees until I saw my chair. It was a downed tree laying beside a very old and wise towering pine. I used the bottom of my shoe to scrape a little spot and clear the bark off. And as I sat, I just listened. I pulled out my pen and journal and I noticed standing there between my feet were this teeny little seedling. And in that moment, I was in harmony with nature. The giant pine tree beside me and this teeny little seedling from which that giant tree had begun its life. And from that place in nature with my pen and journal, the trees gave me this poem. And I um, would like to close my talk by sharing this poem that I wrote given to me by God and harmony and those trees. And I journaled it in that spiritual afternoon. So listen as I close with my pine top poem is the title of it. Infant seedling, tallest pine, both grow in every season. The new becomes the old with time. Nature questions, not the reason. Circle of life, growth and change. Mother Earth is always giving. From mountain top to open range, in all things God is living. Once a seedling, now I stand tall, my branches reach to the sun. Snow is coming after fall, new life has just begun. The wind moves gently through the trees, in silence I can hear it. I commune with the God inside of me. All is one in the great spirit. Thank you.